Welcome to the Men's Health Unscripted Podcast with Patrick and Cam. We focus on your entire health, mental, physical, spiritual, and emotional to make sure you are good to go every day. Welcome to the Men's Health Unscripted Podcast with Patrick and Cam. And we're here with the Euro coaches, Dr. Hepps and Dr. Sagel. And they're going to teach us all about urology, your kidney health, and why it's so important. We're going to talk about some crazy stories in urology and also how to develop a great relationship with your urologist or any other healthcare provider. So, Docs, thanks for coming on the show. We're super excited to have you. I know this is going to be information rich. How are you doing? Doing great. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, we're excited to be here, Pat. Real pause, yeah, we're real excited quick. to have you guys because a lot of people don't realize like your kidneys are tied into everything that your body kind of functions at. And also your relationship with your providers are very important as well. You want that trust built. So it's definitely great to have you guys on to share some wisdom. Uh, how long have you guys been practicing urology? And just give us a little bit of like a short background of your maybe education and training. So our audience kind of has an idea of what maybe goes into being a specialist and we'll move from there. Yeah, we, so David and I, Dr. Hepps and I have a, it's Dr. Segel, uh, have a combined practice experience of about 25 years. Um, it, you know, urology, sometimes people think we're just, we're just penis docs. That's not exactly right. You know, we, we go to, we go to college four years and then we medical school for four years and then training programs for urology and neurologic surgery are, are five to six years. So a lot of time goes into it. Um, David, I've been, I've been in practice 12 years. How long have you been practiced now? I think going on 15 to 16 years. I, I lost count. <laughs> okay. But yeah, my brother-in-law, as they call me, pecker checker and so forth. And But there's a lot more to urology. And I think it's a really cool specialty. Yeah, it, you have to have a good sense of humor. Um, but I think that everybody in their lifetime is affected by some sort of urologic problem. And I always say to my patients, we're the guys who we're kind of like the guys in your Swiss army knife. You don't know quite what that thing does, but when you need it, you really appreciate that you have it. And that's your urologist sort of. I definitely like that analogy. One of the, one of the guys who kind of got me started in men's health. Um, my, my good friend, Paul is a urologist down here in Tampa. I used to call him Dick doc all the time. Yeah. So we take those sorts of things as compliments. Yeah. Right? That's affectionately <laughs> known as Dick Doc. Yeah. We, we take it in stride. We, we don't have a lot of ego, a lot of, you know, a lot of us is we are surgical subspecialty and there are things in urology you can do from little tiny little procedures to major procedures. And, um, we're, we're I think all of us urologists in general are good guys have good, uh, person, generally a good attitude about what they're, uh, what they work on. For sure. That's I, kind of I funny. Your, uh, your brother-in-law, you mentioned, uh, did he have to be prior military by chance? Cause we use that term like pecker checker or like Dick watcher or something like that. Um, cause when we take drug tests in the military, if they love to pop them up on you, uh, they have to have somebody of a seniority watching you pee. So essentially you're standing there Dick in hand and a guy is just like on that junk. So we normally use to kind of dig at each other, but he, did he happen to have prior military? Yeah. Training? My brother-in-law is a retired Navy. So oh, that's a, got him. Yep, you hit the nail on the head. That's very impressive. And that's I have good to touch. Yeah, good mojo. Yeah. <laughs> impressive. Awesome. So uh, really excited to have you guys on today because we haven't really talked too much about the kidneys and they play such an important role in our function or in our body function, regulating blood pressure, uh, red blood cell production, all kind of stuff like, you know, excreting drugs, metabolites, uh, just keeping your blood clean for the most part, like in layman's terms. But, you know, let's talk a little bit about the kidney and kind of what it does in the body and some really important high notes on uh, how to keep your kidneys healthy. Yeah. So, I mean, I think when you think about kidney, you think about the grand filtration of the body, right? I mean, 15 to 20% of the blood flow in the body is going through the kidney at any particular time, um, which is a lot. You know, and so the biggest way that you can improve your kidney function is to make sure to stay well hydrated, right? So we see people that are getting kidney stones not infrequently only because uh, they're not well hydrated. Classic ones are construction workers, um, guys that are truck drivers, et cetera. Uh, they're not taking care of their kidneys because it's hard to find a place to pee. Right. And so if you can't find a place to pee, you're going to take less fluids in. And over time, that can negatively affect your kidney function. One of the other things that people do is I think and you guys see this more than us for sure, is that if something is labeled as 
over the counter, then people will think that it's automatically safe, you know? So they say, doc, I just, I've been taking Motrin for the past week. No problem. It's over the counter. Well, it's like, well, if you take Motrin straight for a whole week, that's, that's terrible for your kidneys per se. So I think that, um, you know, avoiding certain medications certainly is good for your kidney health, staying well hydrated, being cognizant of pain in the back, right? So one of the classic, sign, sign, classic signs of kidney stones is if you have pain on one or both sides, but guys are working out, right? And so they're not sure if the pain is from them working out or if it's from something else. So I think being in tune with the symptoms in your body is super important too, Pat. Yeah, and I would concur. The, the kidneys are very sensitive organs. They don't like low blood pressure, and that can uh, occur when you're dehydrated. But at the same time, they don't like high blood pressure. So you have to find they really like a sweet spot. Um, so it's important to maintain a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet. Um, they don't like glucose, excessive glucose. So diabetics, you know, they're at high risk for kidney problems. So those people with high, who are hypertensive, blood pressure issues, who are diabetics, you know, those more in the realm of the nephrologists. They're the they're the smart guys. They prevent dialysis and that kind of stuff. We're kind of the monkeys who work on the stones and the problems the surgical problems of the kidney. But we also try and impress upon our patients that, hey, you want to maintain your blood pressure in a very, very in a sweet range. You want to avoid dehydration. And you really want to have excellent glucose control because all that can contribute to the health of your kidney. It is a really interesting balance act you do. Uh, as you mentioned, like how dehydration kind of rolls into your blood pressure and things like that. Um, you know, in the Marine Corps, we have the saying, uh, it's called hy so hydrate or die. So it's a, obviously in the military, especially as we're doing our desert operations, stuff like that, water intake and things become very important. Uh, I remember when I was in boot camp, there we had trough to pee in and boot camp. And um, I was peeing, you're just, you're just looking down, not really paying attention. And we can talk about it later on, but, you know, you use your urine color kind of as a, as a little bit of an indicator on your hydration. And as I'm peeing in the urinal, this like orange Gatorade comes coming down <laughs> past me. Yeah. And I was like, what in the fuck is going on? So I look over and it was this big dude and he's just pissing out like the darkest, dankest piss I've ever had. And I was like, you need to like get checked out. What is going on? And I guess he had not drank water in like a day and a half. And in the swamp of South Carolina, it's, that could be pretty dangerous and things like that. But a lot of people kind of forget about that. And then you see, as you mentioned, truck drivers, have they have issues peeing. I'm sure a lot of us will go down the highway and you noticed milk jugs on the side of the road that have this weird dark color <laughs> stuff in it. So you can tell their hydration isn't yeah. really, um, in part of it, not being played ball with either. Well, um, that's a great point, Cam. And the other thing about it is that it, what people, the one of the key words with your kidney health is irreversible, right? So mm -hmm. if you stay dehydrated and you're taking a bunch of non and anti-inflammatory drugs, and your kidneys take a hit, or some people have one kidney and don't even know it, and it takes a hit, that can be a permanent change. It's not like you can always recover that kidney function. So doing this on a regular basis is really important. And we're all busy. We're all you know running around doing stuff. I think it's great for people to just get a big Yeti and just fill it up constantly during the course of the day. And when it's filled up, you're sitting in front of you and you, and you have an automatic kind of uh, prompt to, to stay hydrated. Yeah, well, totally. I totally agree. I remember, I don't know if it was a Marine or somebody who told me above their urinals, they had pictures of the co different colors and yep. said, that said, hey, if your urine's this color, you're two liters down. If your urine's clear, you're hydrated. You know, so that's a, like you said, a poor man's way of just telling guys, hey, if you're a kid, for us, it's kidney stone formers. That's where we harp it on. You know, the fundamental underlying like baseline ground line level is you just got to drink. You got to stay hydrated. And I always tell folks, hey, a poor man's way is if your urine's clear, you know you're hydrated. You know you're good. You know, if it's getting dark yellow, dark, it could be vitamin. It could be a lot, lot of different things, but you know you need to drink more uh, fluids. And that's that's essential. That's a that's a good way. And I, I have a trough in my bathroom, by the way. No, <laughs> so I, I mean, got to ask, I gotta ask, and I've heard conflicting kind of reports, so I guess we'll clear it up right now. Do you guys judge the urine on the stream or at like what the color is that hits the toilet or does it really matter? Like if, cause you know, there, there's clear streams and then when it kind of hits the toilet, it starts to yellow up a little I bit. I think that we, I think from a practical standpoint, it's always what it is in the toilet, right? Be, because 
because we just were not watching guys empty their bladder in real time. On some some occasions we are, if we do certain studies, like a study called urodynamics, where we measure the pressure at which people urinate at, et cetera. But in general, it's something that we're observing after they go. Now, what gets confusing, actually, when you said this, um, I thought about when we're in the hospital and we ask the nurses to hold on to somebody's urine so we can get a good surrogate for how much blood is, is in the urine or what it looks like, how dehydrated they are, et cetera, that's going to look different than what it is in a toilet bowl, right? Because automatically when it hits the toilet bowl, it's going to be dilute. So some people think that they're really well hydrated, where if there's a few gallons of water in the toilet bowl and your urine hits it, well, it's going to look more dilute. So if you really want to get an idea for how hydrated you are using your urine color as a surrogate, getting a urinal and taking a look at it is probably a better, better way to do that. Or a Gatorade bottle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah classic right. like dumb and dumber, right? Like <laughs> well, what yeah. I've noticed yeah. uh, for that is something I've done myself is I kind of pay attention to where it's hitting into the bowl. Um, especially the first bit of that stream, because that's where you're going to get not the immediate mixing yet. So you'll have, it's not going to be accurate a hundred percent, but it's going to be a lot more clear of a picture of what your urine color is going to be as composed to, or opposed to it being diluted out in the rest of the bowl. So I really kind of, if you're checking your, your dehydration level, definitely kind of keep an eye out where it's hitting in that initial set of streaming. Yeah. yeah it's so. funny too, because I, you know, as, as we're talking, I remember I had, you know, one of my favorite professors when I was training and he told us about this really unethical experiment they did on medical students back in the day where they took half the medical students um, and they inoculated. So they put bacteria. And I said this in one of the videos that we made, but they put bacteria in their bladder and they took another half of the medical students and they did the same thing. And then they had one of the groups just stay really well hydrated. OK. And the other group wasn't as well hydrated, but they got antibiotics. And guess which one cleared the bacteria out, the urinary tract infection out quicker? It was actually the group that was well hydrated and didn't get antibiotics. So that's kind of a testament to, you know, and we're all getting bacteria in our urinary tracts periodically for a variety of reasons. But if you can flush it out, it's a good thing. Oh, yeah. I have I actually had a, a client with a chronic like UTI issue, but it was more fungal. And we were kind of trying to lock it down. And, and you know, his uro urologist was saying, like, dude, you need to drink more water. Like, this will solve this problem. And he's like, eh, <laughs> I don't really want to. And just not a big water guy. And it was almost like, you're going to continue to have this problem. All you have to do is drink water. Like, let's, let's make the smart choice. So it is pretty crazy. I, I've come across that quite a few times where, some, especially guys, I think, can really clear an infection just by staying really well hydrated. Yeah. And it's not, it's not a sexy thing, right? It's like, it's not some cool supplement that you're getting on Amazon or you're Googling. <laughs> it's just water out of your tap. So people are like, bullshit, that's not going to do anything. You know that? Tell me something that's cooler than that. I came to the doctor. I want to <laughs> hear some inside info. It's like, right. nope, just yeah. water. Man. Just drink yeah, water. A lot of, <laughs> yeah. A lot of the answers are sitting in front of us, you know, exercise, eat right, drink right. They're the hardest things though. And there's sometimes there's a little like ma medical magic, but for the most part, you know, just st stick with the fundamentals and that'll get you there most of the time. For sure. So we talked a little bit about kidney stones. I, this is definitely something we haven't discussed on the podcast, but I feel like affects quite a few men, um, especially like you said, construction workers, drivers, all kinds of things like that. So what exactly are kidney stones? Like how do they form? And maybe it's just some things that other than maybe not being hydrated enough or some things that might trigger the formation of kidney stone and cause it to become a bigger issue. Sure. So um, kidney stones are crystals that form in the kidney and uh, certain things can affect the ability of these crystals to form. It's like a chemistry experiment, basically, in your kidney. You know, if you have a glass of water and you have all these electrolytes, these crystals that are, are these electrolytes that eventually can form crystals and subsequently form stones, fun, like we had talked about, the more the bigger the glass of water the less likely those crystals are form. It's just dilutional. But stones form, definitely there's a genetic component. We don't know the genes that come, but a lot of our patients, their mom formed them, their dad formed them, cousin, this, that, and the other. So there's definitely some 
chemical predisposition within the kidney that these um, stones crystallize and forms. But the kidney gets filters out and gets rid of all the bad excessive electrolytes. So some of these include calcium. Another thing is oxalate. The most common stone is calcium and oxalate. So if you have a high amount of this calcium and oxalate, and they combine and they crystallize. And there are certain ways, tricks we use to try and prevent those electrolytes from uh, crystallizing. So basically they form at the tips of the kidney and they form like these little stalactites, these little that attach to the tissue. And what happens is when these stalactites sort of drop, the kidney shaped like a funnel. So they, they release from the tissue and then they fall into an area called the ureter. It's like this skinny little tube that is, can be like a, a 10 inches long or so. And what it, it's like a coffee stir and it's really small. So it takes the urine down into the bladder. And so stones as small as three millimeters, two, we're talking on the millimeter level here, they they fall they cause an obstruction and that back pressure causes severe pain. So the kidneys are very sensitive to this pressure, this back pressure. Kidneys are still gonna make urine, but that urine's not moving through. So what happens, it swells up, like you pinched a balloon, but you're still filling it with water, backs up and all that pressure causes severe pain. And some people, you know, lots of ladies have said, hey, I had three kids and I've had one kidney stone. I, I go through childbirth, and get, go through pregnancy rather than have a kidney stone. So it's a, that severe pain makes folks say, hey, I want to do anything I can to not form these things again. Now, most folks on average will form relatively small stones and they'll pass. And it can take anywhere from a couple of days, but it can take weeks. You know, everybody's a little different. And then we are the guys who go in and sort of can if those stones aren't passing or you're getting really sick, we'll go in with special scopes and take care of them. Um, but we also do work with, in collaboration with the nephrology guys who I mentioned before to work on prevention. So that's the basics, I guess. It's really crystal formation with a genetic predisposition in the right chemical milieu. And the what we do as urologists is we go in surgically and can break these stones, but also we help you adjust that chemistry so that hopefully you form less stones. This is another one of those things where I think people aren't going to want to hear it, but drinking that water is going to help relieve that. Uh, my brother actually suffered for some, from some kidney stones a few years back. And for whatever reason, he was going through like a gallon of milk in like two days. And it was consistent for like a few weeks to a month or so he was doing that. And he developed these stones. Um, and he's a roofer, so he's out there working in the sun down there in Florida. So it's just he needs that hydration replaced. Um, and I told him like, what, why would you not be drinking water? And he's like, I don't want to drink milk. And I was like, that's why you're in this situation. <laughs> but he said himself, he'd rather have his nuts kicked off than have to go through another set of kidney stones as well. So like okay. if anything else can like give patients any kind of heat, like just the pain you're going to experience with the stones is way, way more intense than that nasty taste of the water you think your tap has. Yeah. And Shallon, where Shallon grew up, they call it the, I mean, some books, they call it the stone belt because everybody down there, he'll tell you in, in the, in North Carolina, it's sweet tea, right? Yeah. And tea oh, has yeah. a lot of oxalate. Just like you said, milk has a calcium. Teas have, and guys go around with those gallon jugs up here. We have Turner's iced tea. Like guys roll around with these gallon jugs. They're just sucking them down. And I'm like, that's, you can't do that, you know? And they think, yeah, more fluid is good, but you know, there are certain foods and dietary things that we can sort of give you give the patients to have sort of help them uh not form these stones again and then like the the psa that we tell we try to tell everybody this about kidney stones especially guys is that um you know like david mentioned the reason why stones cause pain is because of the back pressure right so i it's nice that we have sinks in all of our exam rooms because it's a perfect analogy right the sink is like your kidney and the drain is like your ureter so when the drain becomes clogged with the stone then you're freaking out because the pain is so bad but what happens and this is this is where we see kid, that kidney stones actually can destroy kidneys is that when you have an obstruction for a, from a kidney stone, you'll have all this acute pain because of the phenomenon that I just mentioned. But over time, your kidney will start to shut down. 
And so the blood flow going into the kidney becomes less and less and less. So your kidney's dying because of the stone over time. So what we'll oftentimes do is we'll see guys that um, they might have gone to the ER uh, and they said, listen, you got a little stone, you're going to pass it. And the guy has no more pain. And they just assume that they passed it. But that's not what's going on. What's actually going on is that stone is in the ureter, but because the obstruction has been going on for so much time, there's not blood flow going into the kidney. Their kidney's dying. And if they show up two, three years later and we do a CT scan, we might see that the kidney is, you know, essentially not really there anymore because, uh, you know, they didn't get it taken care of initially. So I, that's kind of my PSA for guys is that if somebody tells you, you get a, you get a stone, make sure you see a urologist, even if you're not having pain anymore. Yeah. Cause a stone can cause silent blockage or silent swelling. We call it. And that kidney doesn't like that, even though you're not having pain and then the kidney function just dies. And we see, we've seen guys here and there. It's not it's, it's uncommon, but it's not that uncommon. That stone just gets lodged there. They get a CT scan for another region and that kidney just shrunk away and it's now non-functional. Effectively, you have one kidney left. So that's why if you go to the ER or the guys tell you to follow up, that's the rationale. We just don't want, they don't just don't want to harass you and make you go to the doc. They're like saying, hey, in the small ch chance, you, you want to make sure your kidney's okay. So for sure. Yeah. I, I, I kind of want to bring this into perspective for our audience. So you guys have been practicing for quite some time, as we mentioned at the beginning. On average, I mean, how many patients would you say you maybe see a week or a month with some type of kidney stone or even if they've gone to the ER and passed it, just to kind of give some perspective of like the frequency of this and to not take it more seriously, really? I'd say, you know, that's a great question because, <laughs> you know, David and I, our practices are busting. We have, you know, enough people. It's you know, clinically we're very busy and I, and we see, you know, sometimes up to 50 people a day. I think that we could both just make our living just on kidney stones, you know? I mean, so I, I really think half the people that we see have been affected by a kidney stone at one point in their interactions with us. So, I mean, you could do the math, but it's a ton. Yeah. Either they've had a stone or have an acute episode of a stone. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a lot of high percent. For sure. I, I definitely appreciate that too, because you guys deal with a lot of different things. I mean, you're dealing with prostate, bladder, you know, there's a lot of other issues. And then we're, you know, we've kind of honed it down to kidney for the beginning of this episode. And you're saying that you could probably make a living just on kidney stones. So guys really take this seriously. I mean, that's, yeah. that's kind of the point, make sure you're hydrating. Yeah. And um, one more question as well is, I know you mentioned that there were some food and drinks that people intake and we kind of mentioned tea and, you know, milk and potentially and probably soda, but would you say that it's a combination of those things or would it be just someone over consuming one thing? Like, you know, in Cam's brother's situation where it's just like, I just wanted milk and I'm on top of a roof. And so he probably had this huge concentration of calcium that kind of led to it. Would you say that it's multifactorial or one thing in particular that you see a lot of any insight? Yeah, I mean, I think that it's almost always multifactorial. You know, um, it, it, people always ask us kind of what are some general recommendations so that they don't get stones. And we can't ever give them true general recommendations because each person is creating stones for different reasons. So, I mean, if you take somebody that might have an elevated BMI, um, their their blood is a little bit more acidic than somebody else's, and that will precipitate kidney stones, right? You take somebody with a family history of uh, kidney stones, and they're, <laughs> I hate to say they're screwed, but it's like they're, they're going to get stones at some point because their urine tends to crystallize more than other people. Um, the, the most common stone that we see is calcium oxalate stones, and so we will give recommendations for ways to avoid kidney stones based on that. So if people are looking for general recommendations, we usually say um, increase your hydration, decrease your sodium, um, decrease your animal protein intake, um, increase your citrate in your diet. Citrate's found in things like limes, lemons. And you know, a useful tip is if you take a lemon or a lime and just squeeze it in a glass of water, um, don't put sugar in there because you don't want to be just drinking tons of lemonade and do that once a day. That can oftentimes be very helpful. But as a blanket statement for all different 
different kinds of stone formers. I think increasing your hydration and sometimes decreasing your sodium works, but in almost uh, every person that we see, it's multiple different factors that are causing it. Yeah. And just to reiterate what Shallon already said, I tell folks like Shallon said, you know, fundamentally hydration is key. If you're not drinking, you're going to be stuck and you can spend 50, hundred bucks on a fancy water bottle, but that's a lot cheaper than going to ER three times and getting sick and having a procedure, you know what I'm saying? Uh, also, and then the, I, I tell folks like Shallon said, there's two things that you want to increase that's fluids and citrate. Um, like Shallon said, Three things you want to decrease that's oxalate and that's in like leafy greens. There's a lot of good stuff has oxalate, but if you're drinking like that gallon of tea, you know, that's a, that's a factor. Decrease oxalate, decrease your salt because salt pushes calcium into the kidney. So these are, that's a very actionable thing people can do. Also, you don't want to eat too much animal protein. It's not that you have to be a vegan, but don't go eating that. 32 ounce of steak every night. You know, you got to eat what you eat, but just it's a healthy diet in general. And then calcium intake, they've shown that too little and too much. It's a Goldilocks thing, you know, that just right level. So you want to eat a couple of servings a day because a too little or too much is not good either. So oh, the, yeah, that the, moderation thing plays pretty importantly. Um, one thing I do want to note, we talked, you talked about us a little bit earlier, uh, people with like certain medications too. So a lot of people don't realize that a lot of medications cause constriction on the blood flow through either into or out of the kidneys. So, you know, NSAIDs that you'd mentioned plays a big role in that, but even some blood pressure medications will constrict um, certain areas of that filtration process. And some people don't realize, most won't realize that you could have potential issues with that because you're taking a certain medication or if you're taking ibuprofen every day, you're going to be increasing that chance to have these blockages or increasing, you know, the amount that you may be you know, of the electrolytes and other salts that you may have processing through. Um, I do like I do like the uh, citrate thing. That's something that I don't really recall. So that's a good information there. You know, Gasparilla just happened uh, in Tampa <laughs> a little bit ago. So everybody get out there and avoid scurvy. You know, get yourself some lemons and some limes. Yeah, I think that's a good point too, Ken. Because you know, sometimes you just you take a medication and you've taken it for years and you haven't had any side effects from it, so you assume that it's fine. Like there's no problem with taking this medication. But if you take a medication like Topamax, which people take for seizures or migraines and a variety of other conditions, um, they, they may be silently forming stones over an extended amount of time and not know that. So when they get on a medication like that and they learn more about it, they say, you know what, that pain in my back, it might be because of a stone. Or maybe I'll talk to my doc about whether I should get an ultrasound to make sure I don't have a stone. So I think it's, that's a great point. It's just, you know, the medication, every medication that you take, even if you're not having overt side effects from it, it could be doing stuff on the inside. And one of the nice things about, um, as we talk, you know, all those recommendations that are general blanket statements, they're ten they tend to be making individuals healthier, right? So decreasing animal protein, decreasing sodium, increasing your hydration, having lemons, limes in your diet. So hopefully you're having fruit in your diet. So, and then making um, weight loss, weight loss will decrease your chance of having kidney stones too. So all those things go hand in hand with just having a healthy lifestyle. Yeah. The um, 19 to 20 year old me with a baseball player with my arm about to fall off and the amount of ibuprofen I was taking daily. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you guys about it. I don't want to alarm you. <laughs> but just like thinking about, you know, how much of that goes into and and really like how much young athletes are taking ibuprofen and not knowing and and things like that. So I, I would imagine that that probably contributes quite a bit. I don't know if you guys see the youth dealing with that, but um, my, like at the end of my college baseball days, like my arm was ready to fall off and I was just trying to get through and doing whatever I could. And and there was a heavy diet of ibuprofen in, in yeah. my life. We can kind of move it along from the kidney. Um, that's a great perspective, and we really appreciate that. Yeah. I, I learned a lot. I mean, for sure. I know Cam did too. So let's kind of move it down to the bladder a little bit. I know we've discussed bladder issues before. What are some common bladder issues guys have? And um, we kind of talked a little bit about a really cool bladder um, pacemaker that you guys talked about. So we can maybe talk a little bit about that as well. So common bladder issues, we'll kind of get started there and move on. Yeah, I think that um, when I always try to create analogies so patients can like get empowered and figure out the way their body works. So if guys, you know, I think that oftentimes we think overactive bladder is associated with women, but that's not the case. I mean, guys 
tons of guys have overactive bladder. And the primary reason why is because as your prostate enlarges, as you get older, your bladder is a muscle like any other muscle in your body, your quadriceps, biceps, et cetera. And it'll get bigger and thicker and it'll sometimes squeeze too much because it's a muscle that is un involuntarily squeezing. And when that happens, then you're going to feel like you got to run to the bathroom, urgency, frequency, et cetera. And so it's a function of having a prostate that's getting bigger over time. And since we know that every guy's prostate is getting bigger minute by minute, all four of us, our prostate's getting bigger during this podcast, you know, we're going to all have some issues with urgency, frequency, and overactive bladder going forward. And then we try medications for it oftentimes as a first line therapy, along with behavioral modifications. But then, you know, the bladder pacemaker is a, a cool option for people. I don't know if David, you want to talk about that at all? Yeah. 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 The bladder is sort of a simple organ like us urologists. It holds <laughs> urine and it empties urine, you know, it does two things. And basically, you know, you can be messed up in holding urine. You can hold too much. Um, you can hold too little, you know, and bladder overactivity is feeling like you got to go all the time. Got to run, got to, you know, you're hitting the the garage door. You turn on the, turn on the sink or you feel it, think about it. Next thing you know, you have to pee. And there's a lot of things like Sean mentioned that you can do to sort of uh, improve that sensation. It affects a lot of guys. We see a lot of guys, but it affects all of us. But if you're sucking down eight, diet cokes in two hours during your meeting you're gonna pee a lot and caffeine like certain behavioral stuff dietary stuff that's fundamental you got to look at what you're doing and then there are receptors on the bladder that the medicines that we use sometimes that it hits it, the medicines hit these receptors on the bladder to allow you to hold more so the analogy that i use is when we're when we're little kids infants the bladder fills and it just pushes right the little little kid just pees out he doesn't know he doesn't care he pees into his diaper as we get potty trained the bladder fills it sends a signal to our spinal cord up to our brain that says hey i'm full your brain says not right now i don't want to go and you, you can hold it but in overactive bladder the bladder says up yours i'm gonna go i don't care what your brain's saying and some guys leak or they got to run or you see that guy you know who's like knocking your throwing elbows and you got you know into the toilet so there are medicines and then there's like a bladder basically a pacemaker it affects that neurologic system that's been out of whack we don't know why it's out of whack but we can utilize that neurologic system to improve people's functions and their lifestyles so it's some some guys i'm like who wants a pacemaker for the bladder right nobody does but some people despite the medicines they're doing all the right things they're watching their diet but they're handcuffed to a toilet and they don't want to go out unless they know Hey, where is the bathroom? They're worried. They know all where all the bathrooms is. They go to Home Depot and they know that there's one there. They know there's one in Target. And so they do their rounds and their shopping based on the toilet. So some people are so handcuffed like that, that this device, in, it can be transformational for them. And it basically works on that neurologic system where we access certain nerves that are geared towards the bladder and it's like we we don't know exactly how it works but the thought is the neurologic input the nerves are firing abnormally imagine i use the analogy like a, a rheostat like that dimmer switch like you want it in your room just right kind of in between so if that if the nerves are fired up you got it totally the nerves are firing too high you provide that low grade stimulation and that will set the dimmer switch back to normal so that the bladder functions normal. And also it can work for guys who can't be. There are people who the bladder just holds urine. It, it can store it, but it can't empty it. So this same device actually in the rheostat that's turned too low, it can kind of turn it the other way, right? So that's this uh, device that we use in certain patients. Again, it's not in most patients, but it's a really cool option and the technology's there. It's basically the same technology that people use for pacemaker concept, for pain concept, uh, for neurologic seizures, they've used pacemakers. And so um, this has really improved some people's lives. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's cool too. I mean, you know, I think when we talked before, you guys were asking, what are some of my favorite surgeons? And I thought, oh, you know, we, we get we get to do a lot of cool stuff, right? I mean, it's really neat to be able to treat prostate cancer, treat kidney cancer, treat bladder cancer. Um, you know, it's a privilege to do that. But when you when you 
when somebody's leaking and they can't go to the movies and they can't have dinner with their wife, you know, and then you put one of these things in and their life is immediately better. It's, and they're crying with happiness because of it. I think that's one of the most gratifying things that we can do. And it's interesting when, you know, with, with the way David describes it, people say, well, how the heck does that work? It can help with people that can't pee. It can help with urgency. It can help with frequency. These things are really cool in that, that you actually have, they might even have an app now, but that you have a remote control and you have all these different settings and you can play around with the settings until you can get your urination exactly right, exactly the way you want it. And, you know, the company that we use um, does a really good job with kind of talking through people on how to troubleshoot um, these different settings and get it so they're in an optimal range. So it's a neat procedure. That is awesome. really interesting, actually, to think about that. They'd be able to kind of control that. Um, is that is this particular product and this procedure strictly for those who have like neuromuscular issues with urinating or are people who have like social anxiety issues able to opt for the procedure if, you know, they have trouble relieving themselves in public. So like they plan to go to the target restroom, but they get there and there's guys in the urinals and the stalls are all full and they just can't relieve themselves at that point. Is this an option for them as well? I think it's, yeah, I think it is. And the reason why is because oftentimes those people you know, they already have um, like a predisposition to having issues with urination, Can What I mean to say is that they probably have some baseline overactive bladder, urinary urgency and frequency. And then that social aspect of it is putting them over the edge, right? So it's the same thing like guys or people that can't sleep. If you can't sleep, then it becomes this self-fulfilling prophecy where you're just like, I'm worried about being able to sleep, then you can't sleep. So these guys that have urgency, frequency, et cetera, then they start worrying about it and it makes the overactive bladder even worse. So I think that it does work for people like that because it's treating the primary problem. And once they feel empowered and they say, you know what, I don't have the urgency and frequency, that anxiety associated with it also goes away. That's awesome. Yeah, I was thinking too, I mean, it's got to really be a benefit to a guy maybe with BPH or somebody who's experiencing that, that urgency frequency and you can't sleep at night because you're getting up every couple hours to go pee. And, you know, sleep is so important just to our overall health and getting up and waking up and got, having to go pee and, you know, the risks that it might have, you know, for somebody who's elderly. So I think that's a great aspect of, of your practice that you can kind of relieve some of those issues, help people sleep better and like really kind of help like the old guys get up and not trip and fall over a rug or something when they're scrambling for the bathroom at night. Yeah, seriously. A lot of times like uh, these old, if you're taking care of your grandpa or you're, you know, you're older and it's just your mobility's kind of not that great. Like you said, you fall and break a hip. There's a 50% chance that you, you're going to die, you know, in the hospital. That's the data. Now that's a little bit older data, but if you're frail, elderly, and you're getting to the toilet and a lot of the time that's the problem. So it's, it's, even though you think, oh, it's just a pee. I just got to get pee. You fall and do that. Yeah. It's, it's arguably deadly. You wouldn't think just peeing is deadly, but yeah, it can be, you know, from that, it, looking at it, that angle. Um, are there any aside from like the terrifying thought of million dollar babying yourself with a bathroom rug and the toilet bowl, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's serious. We see plenty of old folks and, uh, you know, it's just something to put in the back of your mind if you're taking care of an older family member, you know? Yeah. Are there anything like, you know, common complaints that guys come in with for frequency and urgency that might kind of you know, trigger your thought process to prostate or BPH or, you know, bladder issues other than like, I'm just peeing all the time or I can't at all. I think that it's just a demographic thing. So, I mean, if you see a guy that's above 50 and then um, he starts to have complaints of urgency, frequency, et cetera, we assume it's their prostate causing the overactive bladder because that's most likely what it is. Now, there's additional diagnostic studies that we do. Sometimes we'll look in their bladder. I'll do an ultrasound of their kidneys and bladder, et cetera, to try to figure out, um, you know, is there something anatomically wrong? But it's one of these things that, you know, that's the diagnosis until proven otherwise, just because uh, it's so common after that age when your prostate gets enlarged. Yeah. And also in, in younger guys, it depends on their symptom. You know, we can oftentimes tease out what we think's going on. And usually we're right. But um, like in younger guys, 20, 30 year old, 
they can have scar tissue if they've had an infection in the urethra or trauma there, or they, they don't even sometimes remember. Maybe they'll say, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, when I was a, you know, a teenager, I was jumping over fences. And I got hammered once, and I don't even remember. I had some blood. And next thing you know, five, six years later, and what happens is the urethra should be a nice, like, train tunnel, you know. Yeah, but sometimes you can get scar tissue in there. And then you end up, you know, to a certain extent, you can be peeing through a pinhole, literally. And you don't notice it, like just the hydraulics of the system. And I'm not a hydraulic engineer or anything, but it can get pretty tight before you're really noticing it. So in younger guys, that's called a urethral stricture. And it can happen for many different reasons. But in younger guys, I wouldn't say that's the common thing, but that's going to be more likely arguably than in large prostate, right? Because you, you, your prostate really doesn't start growing until you're in your 40s, 50s, and so on. So a 20, 30-year-old guy comes in and he has all these urinary symptoms and you sort of make sure there's no infection, maybe do an ultrasound. You're like, hey, we, we need to look in there and see. And then it's you look in there with a scope in the urethra and all of a sudden it's wide open. All of a sudden you see this pinhole opening. You're like, hey, there's a scar tissue. There's stricture. No wonder you're peeing like that because you're peeing through a pinhole and you've just been sort of struggling for the last few months. You know, and we can fit. These are things we can fix, but it's just a mechanical plumbing. That's all it is. Urology just glorified plumbing in many ways. So it's actually really good to hear that you guys can actually repair that because um, it got me thinking about it. Um, during my first uh, deployment overseas, they towards the end of it, they started issuing us this stuff we call the diaper. And it essentially was like a Kevlar bikini we would strap on um, for our undersides because obviously if you were stepping on, um, we call them toe poppers, like little mines, they were kind of exploding and obviously causing damage down there. So it had to have gotten to a point where they felt the need to make armor for it and then issue armor out to us about it. So there's got to be a good portion of, of individuals who's had some kind of experience who may have some damage to the urethra caused by stuff like that. So obviously, depending on the amount of damage, there could be a chance for them to get it repaired if they are having issues relieving themselves. Yeah, for sure. This is something that if guys are having persistent problems, I mean, if it's just a one-off here or there, you have some burning pain, you know, again, hydrate up. But if it's persistent, you're like scratching your head, this isn't normal. You should just get checked out because there's a lot of options and you don't be, you know, you don't need to be miserable for six months a year or get really sick before, you know, you kind of go in there and get in trouble. So, but yeah, there are lots of things. The goal is ultimately the goal is to preserve the kidney function. You know, it's like I said, if you're not peeing well, obviously it's a quality of life and stuff like that. But if something messes up, everything backs up into the kidney. Right. So right. that's the, that's fundamentally a lot of our efforts are to preserve your kidney function. So the rest is sort of just getting to a point where your quality of life is really good. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've uh, seen strictures. I mean, I've seen strictures so bad. Like if a young guy's saying my prostate's acting up, it's like, well, wait a second. It's not your prostate acting up. There's something else going on here. You know, so a guy in his 20s or 30s says, I don't know what's what's going on with my prostate. And you look in there, you're pro it's very likely you'll see urethral stricture. And like David's saying, we are plumbers. You know, we just probably get paid a little bit better, but we're we're plumbers, you know. And if you're if your black if your bladders if your bladder's um, filling up with urine because it can't get past that stricture, that urine's going to back up to the kidneys in the same way that a guy with a really big prostate it will, or in the same way like what we talked about earlier with the kidney stones. That's a huge problem. I mean, to see a guy in his 20s or 30s with kidney failure because of a urethral stricture when they initially had symptoms, I mean, that's that's another PSA. We just, you don't, don't have to see us, just see somebody about it, you know, because it could be something serious going on. Yeah, it's interesting to your practice revolving around protecting the kidney. I think that's like really interesting. I have never, I've been around a lot of urologists and never really kind of heard it put that way. Pretty interesting stuff. And, and we've never really discussed the kidneys in depth on this podcast. So I think it's really important for guys to know how important your kidneys are really to your body and maintaining how everything's like really working. I mean, it, it, they, it has a huge influence impact on your blood pressure. Uh, and too high blood pressure. We did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with some guys and they're just regular dudes. And they were talking about their friend who let high blood pressure go for too long and it permanently damaged his kidneys. He ended up on dialysis. So it is super, super important to, you know, maintain that good kidney health and, and regularly see somebody, especially if you think something's up. I will say it is kind of funny too, because thinking back on it, Pat, like, <laughs> Just about any any class we had, if there was a drug that even like touched a section of the kidney in any way, like that had its own 
page or two of slides and notes dedicated to it just because it is a super important function and it does unfortunately get overlooked by a lot of a lot of people in the field unfortunately and then as we talked about our you know the friend that happen to go on dialysis because of that, you don't notice it until it's too late or until you potentially have had 30 years of symptoms and now all of a sudden you're getting checked out and you're now you're on the, the transplant list. So we can kind of talk about it a little bit. It's one of the hot topics and uh, we haven't discussed it too much, but um, Dr. Dr. Sagel had kind of discussed with me a little bit on email how important it is to address preopism. And yeah. yeah. And so, you know, we got a, We got a little bit to talk about preopism and and let's discuss what it is and kind of why it's so detrimental to men's health specifically. Yeah, we did a video on that, too. But, you know, priapism is, um, you know, it's for guys that don't know, it's a prolonged erection. Right. So, I mean, you watch the Viagra commercial on TV and they say for an erection greater than four hours, go see your healthcare provider. The reason for that is um, the tissue in the penis is actually dying. So the blood is getting into the penis, but because the erection is so prolonged, um, the outflow has been compromised, then the outflow gets clotted off, so blood can't get out of the penis, okay? So now it's a, it's a situation where there's no blood flow able to go in because the outflow is stopped. It's like a big traffic jam, right? And so every minute, you know, the, the, there's a portion of the penile tissue that's dying. So it is an emergency for sure. And some of the classic situations where we see that are guys that are sometimes doing injection therapy for erectile dysfunction, which no doubt has its place, but it it's, um, problematic if you're over if you're using too much of the injection medication if you're using the injection medication with other medications that's problematic too but this is one of those things i mean one of the reasons we like urology is there aren't a whole lot of emergencies but this is one of those things if they're calling me at three o'clock in the morning with a guy that's had an erection for five or six hours we're coming in to fix it and the way we do that I don't know if you know how, how detailed we want to get it you get about that but you know we have to we have to pull that blood out you know, so we we put a needle into the side of the penis, pull the blood out. We also inject um, medications that are vasoconstrictors, um, phenylephrine, et cetera, to decrease the blood flow into the penis. So we're able to pull it out better. And that's highly effective, um, but it is a very serious, important condition. It's yeah. kind of interesting to think about because especially when you're younger, um, you when Viagra kind of came out and the commercials were happening and you heard that little snippet about the erection last longer than four hours to so your doctor. Most of us would be like, if I have an erection for more than four hours, I'm going downtown. I'm going to pick up some women. We're doing all this stuff. <laughs> but could you imagine like that's your thought about it? And you're like, yeah, I'll, I'll, if it lasts as long, I'm going to go hang out. And then you find yourself in, you know, your guys' office. And then, you know, like no, no uh, offense intended here. But now you have, you know, these two gentlemen just kind of playing around with it. And you're like, damn, this is not how I expect to spend my night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm it's fucking around to find yeah, it out. Yeah, totally. Like I just, yeah, we just recently, it's not uncommon that we see this, but one of the other things I, I tell that's popular now, I think more so now that's used as a uh, sleep aid or a uh, prescription for sleep is trazodone. Trazodone is yep. a huge uh, promoter, potentially a priapism. I just treated a couple of guys, wow. you know, and, you know, by the time you're out having a, like, I agree, you're like thinking four to six hours erection, I'm golden. I'm calling up everybody, you know, <laughs> but <laughs> Really what happens is it's an ischemic, no blood flow. It's like wrapping. It's not quite, but like imagine you wrapped your finger in string and, you know, it can keep it straight, but over time it hurts. So guys come in, they're not so much concerned about the erection. Obviously they're concerned, but they're in a lot of pain. You know, that's what brings them in. They're like, dude, I've had an erection for six hours. I've had pain for the last three hours. I tried everything. I jumped in an ice bath, cold shower. They tried everything, had sex four times. You know, they're trying, but nothing's <laughs> happening. And so they're more than happy sometimes, even though they're freaking out to say, hey, you got to fix me, whatever, whatever the hell, just don't cut it off, but you got to fix me. But the longer you wait every minute, like Shallon said, that ischemia, you keep that your finger wrapped up, it's going to die eventually. So the long-term effects is you're damaging the blood flow 
the healthy tissue to that penis. So if you have a buddy, a guy, you know, someone who's, or yourself is having that problem. You took a trazodone, you want to sleep, your, your doc pre prescribed that you've been fine all of a sudden, you got to get in sooner rather than later because your long-term function can be compromised. And this is permanent stuff potentially. So that's why, like Sean said, there's not too many emergencies, but you don't want to say, Oh, I'll see him. I'll see that guy. You know, ER calls us, Hey, we got this guy. And urologists should not say, hey, I'll see him tomorrow. You know, that's got to be dealt with ASAP because, you know, every, every, every minute, every half hour is going to preserve, help to preserve his function down the road. Yeah. And just to be explicit, I mean, David's talking about permanent erectile dysfunction, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. you know, the, the longer it goes past that time point, it can cause permanent erectile dysfunction, yeah. which is not recoverable. And priapism is from a guy named, there's a Greek god named Priapus. And uh, you can look up some pictures. He was fairly well endowed. So I think oh, that's I where they named Yeah, you know. <laughs> nice. Yeah, if you look up Priapus as a Greek god, and he was sort of a, uh, any event. Hanging. Leave it at that. Um, interesting Google stuff <laughs> back there. It's it's interesting though. Luckily, while that is the more the more serious kind of event for it, guys, if we have like pain in our penis for probably for like five minutes, we're like, yo, we gotta call somebody. Like something's something's happening down here. Cause like at the end of the day, you know, you get herpes, chlamydia, you can bounce back from that. But you show up and then you got that like shriveled up, like what is that? Like um frostbitten looking head member down there, you're not coming back. <laughs> I guess the end of it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So and guys are just embarrassed. They don't know. They're scared. They're embarrassed, you know, and that's normal. But at some point, this is something that we as physicians, you know, we'll just we we'll take care of it like anything else. One of the one of the you know, one of the good things about guys getting medical attention with priapism, this is what we call low flow priapism or the the where the tissue's dying, is that it hurts. Right. So even if they're embarrassed, if they are in significant pain, they're going to get seen. And it's the same phenomenon as a heart attack. A heart attack hurts because there's ischemia. There's a lack of blood flow to the heart. So you have chest pain. That's what's going on in the penis. So guys, you know, will come in with priapism um, despite the fact they're embarrassed because they're in a lot of freaking pain. Um, would you guys say that do you see a lot of priapism from maybe people trying like Viagra Cialis recreationally or people who might actually need it for ED. Is there a difference or can it kind of just happen at any time with somebody who might be using the, those medications? I think the minority of people, it's just from the medication. So if you're using the medications as directed by your healthcare provider, there's a, there's a relatively low chance that you're going to get priapism from it. I think the most common reason why I've seen it in my career is because of injection therapy. And, you know, I guess there's a variety of reasons for that. But if you think about the injections, like guys are injecting and saying, uh, it's not quite working, then they're going to go to a little higher dose. And there's a real sweet spot with injection therapy where you, you want to be right at that dosage because less, it's not going to get you the erections and more, you're going to end up with priapism. So I think that injections, because it's harder to titrate to get where you want to be with the erections are more likely to cause um, priapism. Yeah. And I think um, just to go back, injection therapy is like some guys who have erectile dysfunction, they're, the medicines Viagra Cialis don't work, right? So they go on, they're like, hey, we put these little tiny needles into the penis. And a lot of guys look at me like I have four eyes or like, who the hell is going to do that? But some guys use it and it's uh, from a pharmaceutical, you know, it's a prostaglandin, it's um, papaverin, fentolamine. So it's a, usually a mixture of medicines that dilate the blood vessels. So you give yourself too much medicine in there, you achieve, you get a priority. I rarely, I don't know, like Viagra, uh, Cialis, I, I almost never have seen, probably, I don't want to say zero, but very rarely, to be honest with you. But I have seen in guys who mix, like they're using, like guys who use drugs, like they're, they they have a party, they're taking cocaine and Viagra. Things can precipitate like a combination of stuff. And then trazodone or um, definitely as a trigger, sometimes uh, psychiatric meds can affect, like cause it. So to, from a boots to ground standpoint, I've rarely seen it with just Viagra, Cialis, the more common stuff in and of itself. Usually it's in combination with some other, other things. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, do you think the chances would increase if people are swapping in between Viagra and Cialis? Cause I saw it in uh, community practice often, 
enough where patients would get scripts for both from the same provider. And like, I would call the provider to double check what was going on. And like their instructions were for them to like swap between the two um, based on their tolerance level, which seems kind of, kind of insane. But have you seen any kind of like increases in that based on the dual therapy? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know if I've necessarily seen that. I mean, the thing about Cialis is that it's got, a. I mean, as you guys know, it's got a longer half-life, right? So it's going to be in your system longer. So I, I think, you know, the, it does, there is a theoretical risk if they're taking Cialis, especially at the dosage of, you know, five milligrams daily, and then they're trying to augment erections with Viagra on top of that, they don't know that there's still some Cialis in their, in their system. And so then they're taking Viagra on top of it, where the provider might be telling them, listen, you know, the max dose for Viagra is 100, the max dose for Cialis is 20. So don't take more than either one of those per day. But if they took Cialis on day one, and they're taking Viagra on, on day two in the morning, well, there's still Cialis in their system. So I think that potentially could, I personally haven't seen that. Um, cause priapism but you know as as you mentioned it cam just jogging or getting the wheels turned in my head it could happen yeah i, I think it's it just playing bad. yeah i haven't i haven't i don't know if i've seen it but i think theoretically you don't want to overdose and it's just playing with the side effect profile they're all you know the, the pde5 inhibitors you know they hit that they hit that uh, enzyme to help improve blood flow and the side effects nothing's perfect there's there's that enzyme in our back muscle in our eye so that's why Viagra causes some eye changes and some flushing. You know, it's all management of the benefit versus side effect profile. And each one has difference. That's probably why the P, I use that too. Say, hey, try Cialis. If it makes you feel miserable, try Viagra. And, you know, you see the guy, you don't want the guy to have to come back in or call every second. So we say, what well, you know, he got, he's got ED, we're going to give him. But in terms of priapism, I, ha I haven't necessarily seen that. But theoretically, it's probably an increased risk. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So- uh, as we wind it down, got any uh, crazy stories from the urology department for us? No, we got to do another, do a whole nother podcast. That's on just, that. That's <laughs> a story. Yeah, that's our our lives are a little bit you know every day, every day there's something sometimes more entertaining than others. No, go yeah. ahead, Chow. No, I mean I I remember I think I told you all this story once you know but you know when I was in training it's hard with urology because these are emergencies. But some people can find them humorous for obvious reasons, you know. But I remember when I was in training, there was, uh, there's people that get pleasure out of putting things in their urethra, you know. And there was a uh, there was a guy that kept coming back to the emergency room, and he kept putting different things in his urethra. And I don't know how he stuffed it so far, but he would actually be able to get these things into his bladder. So he must have been you using something to push these objects into his bladder past his urinary sphincter. And I remember fish, I remember getting out a fishing lure from somebody's bladder when I was in training, <laughs> like, like with a like hook, those worm, like those fake worms. I remember, oh, I remember okay. it's like indelible in my brain. I remember it was multicolor. It was green, yellow, red. We pull that out. I remember the same guy came back and we got an x-ray um, on his abdomen before we took him to the operating room and you saw where his bladder was you just saw like you just saw a screw right so you stuck a screw in there we pull that out too um but that's one that's one kind of group of stories that that i'll never forget i'll never forget i don't know david you have yeah. any no i mean you have these balance between like these tra trauma things just well you uh pat you were the baseball player i always say that you know, guys, like I played some baseball and we always wore a protection. You know, you wore a cup in football, they wear a cup. But for some reason out here in Pittsburgh, like the hockey players don't seem to wear that or, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, you'll have these guys uh, every once in a while. It's not uncommon. I had a couple guys there just and the hockey puck is not soft. No, you know, so oh, I guy took the hockey puck <laughs> to the scrotum. Boom. He's swelling up and his testicle basically exploded. Now we can oh, wow. repair that, but it just said it's just proof in pudding that it's worth wearing a cup to all those guys out there in recreational hockey or whatever they're playing. Just put on something protective, a jock strap, something, because that the testicle can it's wrapped in like this special casing. There's all these little tiny tubes in there um, that where the sperm are produced and you bust that casing. It pops out like a I don't know what it's like, like a hot dog out of his casing, you know, and all these mm -hmm. little tubes. Yeah. So we can repair it, clean it up, sew it back up. He did fine. But 
It was out of the hockey season for the rest of the year. Let's put it that way. I can imagine. Yeah, um, I played catcher, so I always wore my cup. Oh, yeah, a, yeah. A foul that was ball your best there. friend. Yeah, a foul ball there with a cup on her. So, I mean, I was just like. Yeah, and, uh, but, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. It's so it's it's good. There's a lot of trauma. But I have one nice thing that's kind of was kind of funny and neat. There was a gentleman with uh, testicular cancer. And it was just funny. It was kind of a. Uh, he was a character, nice guy. He knew he was, he, you know, he was, was everything was, was going to be well contained. He didn't, we did scans. Everything was good. But he said, doc, I have one request for you. I'm like, anything, anything, you know what? He's like, can you play ACDC big balls when I'm going to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, of course, man, we can do it. So we had the anesthesia, the nurses, and we had it blasting as he went to sleep. And it was a nice sort of, and he remembered that he remembered that he did great. You know, no problems, but it's always a balance. You know, it's a serious problem, but as as uh, one of those uh, medical books that I just read said, what can you deliver in the ear uh, that's just as important as many other things? It's words of comfort. So you hear, you know, we try to be uh, of that in medicine. We try to we try to follow that um, theory. So, but it's funny. Love to hear it. And uh, finally, any great tips? From urologists to establish a good relationship with your urologist or your healthcare provider. Uh, for any of our audience listening, I know we do, we always like to kind of include when we talk to a doc or a specialist, you know, what are some good things to do to kind of smooth over that relationship and um, kind of reduce the friction that a patient and a provider might have? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, one thing is you just got to remember, there's not that many urologists for the entire population. So, you know, urologists are busy. I mean, every urologist you see is going to be super busy. I mean, you're seeing between 40 and 80 patients a day. So as much as the urologist wants to spend time and counsel you properly, et cetera, th that individual is going to be on a clock. So when you get in that exam room, remember to just, I think it's really important to stick to the urologic details. Uh, I mean, sometimes we'll see people that'll start talking about you know, they have a sore throat or, um, you know, docs, do you have any tips for weight loss? And, you know, we are physicians, but every minute that that ticks by that we're talking about that, we're not talking about their urinary problem, right? So I would say one thing is to make sure you stick to the urologic facts. The other thing is, um, you know, many urologists and we do in our practice, we have a lot of tentacles, like we're almost like an octopus and we have all these arms that, you um, help us be able to see as many people as we can and help them. Um, so I rely on uh, the doc's physician assistants, nurse practitioner, medical assistants. Don't feel like you're slighted if you're getting advice from them. In, in all likelihood, a lot of these people are super, super experienced and they know what we're going to say. And they usually don't say anything without uh, knowing that we would advocate for it. So if you, if you, if you can make a friend with a medical assistant or a physician assistant, et cetera, and get on their good side, they always have our ear and usually they're a pretty good surrogate for what we're going to say. Uh, so don't feel slighted if you talk to them. Yeah, I agree. Um, be flexible. If you can, uh, you know, say, Hey, if any cancellations, can I see sometimes, you know, if you come in and you have flank pain and you're like, we don't know what's going on. You can see, and it won't, it takes a while to see the urologist. Maybe you see the nurse, um, in a day or less than they can at least order a CAT scan. We know what the hell's going on, you know? So the urologist can, instead of seeing the urologist say, well, I don't know, you need a CAT scan. You can get that in waiting two weeks to see the urologist. They can get that whole workup started. So a lot of times we need tests to figure out what the hell's going on. We can't look into you and say, oh, a lot of it is testing based or laboratory based. So a lot of those tests can be done sometimes with a PCP, primary care doc. But, but a lot of times if you see the nurse real quick, she or he can order those tests and get things started. And also I think just being thankful thankful and being a nice guy, not being kind of like us. We don't, we don't want to, you know, everybody's, there's plenty of dickheads out there. Excuse the Euro, Euro logic, but if you're a nice guy and, uh, you know, just trying to sort of say, Hey, I got a problem. This is really bothersome. You know, I appreciate you, you know, and just be kind of respectful uh, that, that works. That's my mantra, you know, being the squeaky wheel, calling every day, you know, just being nice. You know, sometimes that works for you, but sometimes it works against you. And if you send a note of thanks to the nurse or something like that. That goes a long way because like in every practice, in every field, you guys know it. You see plenty of negative. People don't feel, especially in medicine, people aren't coming to the urologist. Well, 
in general, they're not coming to ER because they feel great. You know, they, right. they have a problem they want to dress or, you know, they don't. So there's plenty of people that are just, you know, they want to feel better. They don't feel good. They're coming in. So a note of thanks, appreciation, you know, just something that says, hey, you know, we'll stick out. And they and I think that makes difference. Not that people will put you ahead in line, but I think that's good on both ends, not only for the doc, the physician, the secretaries who work there, but for you, it's it's give back and give forward, you know? I remember I had a patient um, that would always make a zucchini bread for, for me around Christmas. <laughs> and it was the worst zucchini bread <laughs> we ever had. I mean, it was part of the rock. And I still have this like soft spot in my heart for them, you know, yeah. because it's just like the effort of it. Yeah. You know? So even like, I, you know, like the cards you get from your kids that are like, that are just terrible looking, you still love them, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. So I yeah. think that anything that you do to, to show them that, you know, you, you see us as more than just, you know, a technician, your doctor, yeah, yeah, right. as, you see us as, as people, I think, I think that would go a long way for any healthcare provider you interact with. Yeah. I love it. Well, here are your Euro coaches, Dr. Hepps and Dr. Sagal. Thank you guys so much for coming on the podcast. And um, we'll look forward to that part two with the crazy stories from the urology department. <laughs> but in the meantime, right, we're hey, yeah, we had a good time. Thanks yeah, a lot. We yeah. enjoyed you. We enjoyed you. Thanks. Yeah, where can Thanks, listeners Jan. find you guys and where could they check out your information? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we we created EuroCoach, which is U-O-R, I'm sorry, U-R-O-C-O-A-C-H, because we wanted to have everybody in the world have immediate urologic information um, to to get better educated, you know, because sometimes people are waiting two, three months for urology appointments. People in Australia are waiting many, many months to, to get uh, urology appointments. So we're at YouTube at Eurocoach. We have a whole encyclopedia of plain speak urology uh, education videos. Uh, we try to explain things in the same way that we explain it to y'all here. And then our website's getting built, uh, should be built within 30 days, realurology.com. But for right now, YouTube at Eurocoach. Is that real R E A L? R E A L urology.com and YouTube at U R O C O A C H. Excellent. Well, I'll definitely include those in the description so you guys can find the Euro coaches. Um, it's been a lot of fun, guys, and I know we learned a lot. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, guys. It was fun. Thanks, guys. guys. Appreciate it.